welcome uh, to our session today. Uh, we've got about uh, 19 days left in Oracle's fiscal year end, so we thought this would be a good time to talk about um, your current Oracle negotiations and, and how to get the best deal, either this May or in the future, um, if you're lucky enough not to be negotiating a, a new agreement with Oracle uh, this month. We hope that uh, the information you take from this is helpful. Um, a little, we've, we've got very few slides, so you all like that. It's going to be a lot of conversation. Um, a little bit about me and Palisade Compliance. So I have been um, working on Oracle contracts now for about 26 years. Uh, I started my Oracle uh, career back in uh, 1995 as a contract specialist, drafting uh, Oracle agreements for the um, New York City commercial territory, and then worked my way through that organization. And by the time I left Oracle, I was their global vice president of contracts and business practices. So have reviewed thousands and thousands of Oracle contracts and then left <clears throat> Oracle in 2011, Star Palisade. Uh, and we really just focus on helping customers uh, with their Oracle contracts. So now I'm looking at those agreements from the other side of the table. So how do we get the best deal for our clients? Um, and we still get the uh, the client now and then that wants to uh, buy more Oracle. So we absolutely help that uh, process. And we're independent of Oracle. So we're not an Oracle partner or reseller, really just work for our customers. Um, so that's my background. And I am really happy to be joined by my friend, Jeff Eichen to uh, give the legal side of negotiating with Oracle. So Jeff, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Craig, and, and welcome to all the people who have joined us. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Craig's company for um, more than five years. We have a we have a mutual client, and I just I found them just personally indispensable in the entire process of uh, of of negotiating some especially thorny issues with. Uh, uh, Oracle, we've been through we've been through the audit process together. We've been through the license negotiation process together, and um, I was I was just so impressed with the work that they did that I wanted to uh, I wanted to see how I could be involved in in helping to uh, spread the word about uh, about uh, our mutual uh, backgrounds in this area. Um, I have more than 15 years worth of experience in negotiating uh, significant IT and uh, IT infrastructure and software agreements. And, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've crossed paths in many different, uh, in many different arenas in this field, but mostly we want to, we want to share uh, uh, some brief comments with you, especially since we're right at the, right at the deadline of, uh, of the end of the Oracle fiscal year. And uh, there's probably, there's probably people in the audience who are involved in this process uh, as we as we speak so welcome no and it's great uh, to have you here because you know like you mentioned we've worked together for several years now and uh you know we come across a lot of attorneys uh both in-house counsel and outside counsel and um just like with everybody else there is a mixture of expertise and uh when someone sees an oracle contract for the first time it's sometimes it's a little bit shocking for them um, but you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you've got tons of experience, so we want to make sure people know about you guys as well, uh, because if, if you need an attorney um, to help you with Oracle and not just um, contract negotiations, but audit defense and things like that, uh, we want to make sure that your name gets out there as well. So, uh, you know, thank, thank you. you. So I, I want to just sort of get into it, because like I said before, we don't have um, many slides but we do have some poll questions. So uh, we're gonna put up two poll questions here and then we're gonna talk and then we have another poll question later. And obviously if you all have a um, question, like Marissa said, please, please answer it. You might have to scroll down a little bit, uh, but Jeff, while people are figuring out how they're gonna answer this question, uh, I yeah. want to ask you, what, what was your first experience with an Oracle negotiation? Like, how did you wow. first get involved? Yeah, that's uh, that goes that goes back a, a, a fair amount, and it was uh, it was it was for a particular client that uh, 
had had made it. I think they had existing uh, Oracle licenses. They had acquired a. They had acquired another company that had their own Oracle relationship, and um, you know it was just kind of thrown on my desk, like like, hey, figure out figure out what we have to do here. And you know, by the time I um, by the time I read the agreements, then read the agreements, then read the agreements, it was. I, I, I can say even even as somebody who deals with these contracts, uh, a lot of this language was just impenetrable, and I felt like uh, uh, I felt like I was sort of cast at sea for the first uh, the first uh, few days of the project. But we um, we did get we did get through it. It was uh, it was a fairly contentious negotiation, and I and I was I was left with the feeling that you know having having learned you know the the, the Oracle documents and seen them. You know, across the table, um, this is this is something that I, I think a lot of parties would not have expected. You know what I'm saying? They're, they definitely set themselves into a different category in contract negotiations and in drafting and the way their agreements work. So that it's almost like a it's almost like a sub expertise, and I think that's you know a little sub specialty. And I think that's what that's what uh, that's what you guys have developed over the years. When I um, um, very early in my career at, in, with Oracle, um, I was paired up with somebody from from your company, um, uh, Palisade, and I got, frankly, such an education from working uh, from working with uh, with one of your people. It was uh, it was really a pleasure, and I and I realized that uh, um, you know having having Palisade in there was sort of the secret sauce for uh, for a lot of for a lot of my successes. So, for what it's worth. Right. Yeah, it's um, well. Before we continue that, Marissa, why don't you bring up the uh, results of that first poll question? So, uh, are you currently negotiating a uh, new license deal with with Oracle? That um, and uh, most people said no, you're not. So, uh, but about seventy five percent said no. Um, so twenty five percent said yes. So we'll obviously give you guys some. Uh, hints and tips that you can take away for the next three weeks, hopefully. But then, yeah. um, you know, we'll also uh, give some longer term advice. And then um, most important um, success success factors um, are staying in compliance and getting the right price. Uh, interesting that nobody put terms and conditions. Uh, um, you know, that is, I think, sort of the most underrated aspect of a negotiation you know when we're talking to clients who have um, you know particularly have their procurement departments um, involved with uh, a negotiation they're so focused on price they forget terms and conditions and it's the terms and conditions that will bite you later in compliance, let's say, or in your ability to innovate. Yeah. Um, so, and obviously, Jeff, I would think that that's where your focus is when you're talking to yeah. customers is educating them on those T's and C's. Well, you know, it's 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 like the problem a lot of lawyers have. Like, if every um, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, for <laughs> for, for lawyers, terms and conditions are kind of like our uh, you know our our bread and butter. But I, I will say to the audience, if if you um, uh, if if you can believe this, the the terms and conditions in a lot of the Oracle documents they're they're more negotiable than you would think. Um, they are they are presented as sort of like a fait accompli, and you'll get uh, you get kind of this uh, the, the the message that's delivered with the documents is is oh we don't want to get legal involved and this is a pre printed form and just take it you know it's, it's all take it or leave it uh, type of conditions, but uh, frankly, there are there are areas in the in the Oracle licenses and the ordering documents that are that are very much written by hand and written through negotiations. And the uh, the negotiating power goes up as the as the price of the deal goes up. So so when when you are spending several million dollars and making that kind of commitment, you will get you will get some flexibility on terms and conditions. And those terms and conditions can save you can save you some very good money. You know down the road. But um, I, I guess before we get to the success factors, Craig, I have a, I have a question for you and I've been sort of dying to, I've been holding on to this question because I'm really dying to ask you, um, uh, what do you see are the biggest mistakes uh, 
that clients make in these uh, license negotiations? Like where, where do you see things really going off the rails? I think many times um, customers lock themselves in or, or lock out a lot of their flexibility even before the negotiation starts. Um, so, you know, how to get the best deal from Oracle, it's really simple, is if you can say no, right? If, if Oracle puts something in front of you and you could say, no, I don't need that. And, um, you know, we, we were talking to a client this morning, they want to negotiate their support renewal. And we're explaining to them, you know, and it's, it's significant. It's over $10 million a year. And uh, the renewal comes up at the end of May. So like, how do we get that down? We, we're not using all this stuff. We said, like, well, it's a little late for that, right? You got two weeks, you got three weeks. Uh, Oracle's not going to move very much now, but you're... Um, ability to get Oracle to move that needle is before the next renewal, Oracle says, well, you give me $10, uh, 10, 10 million. How about I give you nothing, right? If you can counter with that, then that yeah. negotiation and that flexibility that you were talking about, because I can confirm from all these years that everything in that agreement with Oracle is negotiable. There's a price on everything. Um, yeah. And that price could be your abilities to walk away or timing, right? The end of May, we, we get a lot of things. So I think, you know, what we're seeing, uh, what we often see is customers are already locked in, right? We told Oracle they won the business or we need more Oracle database to run this project. So I put my red Oracle hat back on. And if a customer says to me, I need your software, there's nothing else I can use. I'm really not going to be too... Uh, anxious to give them a big discount or give them concessions in terms and conditions. So for me, the negotiation is all, often won or lost on the technology. Like if you can walk away from that yeah. and, and even just, you still want to use Oracle, but they want you to do a ULA and you can do something different, right? So that's, that's where we see a lot of the mistakes is, we're, you know, they've dug themselves a hole and we're trying to get out of that. So you know, and, and that's a long-term thing, right? Oracle is a long-term play. Those contracts yeah. are written for long-term lock-in. Um, but what, what do you think? Where do you see customers making mistakes? I don't know. We, I, I, I've, I mean, I, again, I've seen it. I've, I've seen this issue come up again and again. I don't know if it's a mistake so much, but what I see is that um, Oracle seems to have a universal approach to this where they say, um, I, we often have a situation where clients are, they're buying more from Oracle than they need. They're buying much more than they need and much more than they're using. Uh, they might be buying entire categories of, of products that they don't even use from Oracle. And what they've been told is that, is that yes, but you had to buy those products in order to qualify for this discount. In other words, in other words, don't even think about cutting you know, X or Y or Z, because if you cut those down, what we do is we just raise the price of, we just raise the price of what you, we're going to take away this discount or that discount. So I feel like what they, what they've done is, is, is customers almost get into this, like, like Hobson's choice where, you know, if I, if I try to order less from Oracle, it's going to cost me more. So, so I'll just keep, I'll just keep over ordering from, from Oracle. Um, if I decide to, if I just if I decide to certify my use rather than you know keep keeping the U, the EULA going, I'm just going to pay more. So um, I feel like it, it's it's not so much a mistake, but I feel like being aware of that of that game that's going on is can can help the negotiation. And and Craig, I'm a I'm a firm believer in what you said. If if you are not willing if you are not willing to get up from the table and start looking at alternatives you're never going to get a, you're never going to get a decent price. They will, they will stretch themselves and they will push in order to keep business that they're worried about losing. If they're, if they're basically guaranteed the business, their, their interest is not, is, is, is only in getting sort of the highest price from the customer. So we, we see that too. Yeah. The, um, and, and again, maybe it's, it's not a mistake, but it's, it's definitely by design by Oracle, you know, when, when customers, um, come to us, there are times where like, we, we just, we don't know what's in our agreements, right? We take a look. So we have to go through all those agreements and uh, give them our thoughts on, on what's in there, but it's yeah. often what's not in the agreement, 
that is what's going to haunt them later, right? So there are so many yeah. URLs in these contracts. I think the, you know, the 10, 12 URLs in a Oracle database, you know, if you look at their master agreement and their order document. Yeah, and and each and each URL leads to a like almost like a, a, a paperback book full of uh, right. other terms. So you've got the contract, you've got all these URLs, then you've got all this right. other stuff that that Oracle Who's gonna read out, that? Right. So they they have yeah. you know this in the contract it says only the contract applies, but then they put all this right. other stuff out for educational purposes only, right? And it's all made yeah. up, right? It's like Oracle can make anything up and put it out on the internet and say, look, there's a policy. Um, so we're educating customers on when to use those things, when not to use those things, how to push back on them. Cause that's where, you know, that's where the virtualization issue comes up. That's where the cloud issues yeah. come up. And that's where the pricing really impacts whether you need, you know, 20,000 licenses or 50 licenses, you know, right. that could be, right. How you interpret those non-contractual policies is is multi-million dollar stuff when, when you look yep. at it. Oh wait, I got, and I've got one more mistake. I just wanted to I wanted to throw in there. It just just reminded me. Um, I will say this too. There's uh, there's a situation I saw where Oracle was was negotiating a license. They were getting ready to to do a renewal. Um, and the client had said just what just what you just said, Craig. I gee, I don't even know what's out there. I don't even know what I'm what I'm using. I, I, I need help with this. Oracle said, or the salesman at Oracle said, wait a second, we have a solution. Let our let our license audit people come in and do an audit of your systems, and then we'll tell you what what you need uh, to purchase from us. Now that I can tell you of of anything I've ever seen, that is that is just like top of the list for mistakes to do because once once the licensing team you know the licensed l and m team came in uh, and I guess we can talk about audits in a in a bit, but once they start an audit, an audit is 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 a very adversarial process, and it was it all went it all went rapidly downhill from uh, from there but uh, I, guess, I guess we'll 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 get to that at some point uh, in our discussion today, but that's you know, that's something I would not recommend doing again. Well, you know, the, the, the first um, two or three customers we had here at Palisade, they were in very much that situation. And this goes back almost 10 years now, where they let the Oracle audit team in. Uh, and I remember when I was at Oracle and I ran the global audit group, someone came to me with the brilliant idea, Craig, we're going to create this, we're going to call it managed services. I'm like, oh, what's managed services? It's a free service that we're going to offer to customers where they're going to invite us in and we're going to audit them and we're going to tell them what they need to buy. And I literally laughed in the person's face. I'm like, who the heck? That's the most ridiculous thing ever. Who the heck is ever going to do that? They're like, you got to trust right. me. You got to trust me. So I was like, you know what? You're in the field. You see what much more than I do. Go for it. It's a billion dollar business right now for Oracle over the years, I'm sure they've collected much more than a billion dollars yeah. from customers going to Oracle asking to be audited. Yeah, and, and this is something if we, if you, I, I would say if you take nothing at all from this short conversation, don't do that. That that alone can, <laughs> that, that alone more than justifies the price of your being here for a half an hour because that's a that's a process that that Oracle starts in order to when they when they sit down and do a microscopic audit of your system and your processors and your uh, you know your head counts and your your company revenues whatever it is I guarantee you they are going to find. They're going to find reason to up the to up the license price on you. There's there's no set of circumstances where they say at the end of the audit, oh gee, this customer's paying too much. Let's send them a check. You know that just that's not the outcome of very many audits, from what I understand. And um, yeah. to to invite them in to have that happen in the middle of a sales uh, transaction where you're trying to work cooperatively with Oracle, but yet protect yourself against this uh, against this uh, uh, audit team. It's just it's 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 too many uh, you know it's it's too many moving parts. It's a, a the audit is is sort of needs to be treated with with very very much with kid gloves and and with care. And yes. That just... Yes. 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 Um, and I know we're we're sort of focusing a lot on audits here, but really that is the the flip side to 
uh, how to get the best deal, right? Don't get audited, don't ask to be audited, stay in compliance, all that fun stuff. Um, but uh, let's let's try to be more positive here rather than focusing on mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> One or two pieces of advice, if you were, if a, if, a, if a client called you today and said, hey, I'm negotiating this deal with Oracle, either for the end of May or maybe December, let's say, what are the yeah. one or two things that you would suggest they do? Yeah, I, I've gotten, I, I would say I, just, just two things off the top of my head. Number one, um, Oracle, I think, always wants to break down the negotiation into separate deals. They always want, they always want separate transactions because it keeps, it, it, it keeps you from negotiating a package of with a larger discount and with a greater, with a greater benefit to you. So I actually, one thing, one question I always ask clients is what else is on the table? Not just, not just what's expiring on, you know, on May 31st, what's expiring in August, what's coming up in, in December, because if it's possible to, yes, maybe you don't have that much negotiating ability right now, but if you can bring in some other licenses that are going, that are going to need renewal, maybe you can lock in a better price. Maybe you can qualify for a bigger discount. Maybe you can, you know, combine things in a way that, 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 you know, allows you to, you know, gives you a little bit more uh, 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 bargaining power. You've, you've got a bigger, you've got a bigger dollar figure on the end. They're going to care more about it. So that's, so that's one thing. And Oracle doesn't really like you to do that. Um, the other thing I would say is, is more than anything, keep, keep your eyes open for alternatives. Like Craig says, if they think they're going to lose you, the price tends to come down radically. Um, one area that we've found is, and I've just, had some personal experience with it recently is in is in the support uh, services. Uh, support is is something that's that feels like it's built into those Oracle prices. You're always signing up for you're always signing up for you know years and years of support, and they're going to lock in pricing for you. It's also possible to get support for the Oracle programs from third party vendors and in, in in certain situations, and and that. That support is not Oracle support, but it is it is substantially less expensive. Well, if Oracle knows that they're in danger of losing that support, you can see that you can see the effect that would have on the on the negotiation, and that that that's one way to sort of push back against the, you know, take it or you know where where Oracle is is the one dictating all the terms to you. So, how yeah, about you, Craig? It's interesting that you bring that up because what we've seen customers do is they move off of Oracle support, they'll go to a company like Remini Street, and then it's a wake up call for Oracle. Then the next deal yeah. you're negotiating with Oracle, they, hey, these folks, they left us over here. They're not coming back. We need to win their business. We need to earn their business. We're, we can't be order takers here. We, we need to actually be salespeople adding value. So definitely having those alternatives. And I'll give you another example. And it doesn't even have to be a, a non-Oracle alternative. We are helping a client now. Uh, Oracle was proposing a $3.5 million annual Java subscription. You need an unlimited license agreement for Java. Unlimited because this is how you count. Right. And, and here's those policies, those crazy virtualization policies. And, and you don't know right. what you're doing. You, don't, you haven't counted. So we got in there and we did an audit of the client and we helped them because um, they had, a, they had an, an unlimited Java agreement. So now we're in there with the next one. And, the, and Oracle thought, well, they, sent, they spent 3 million last time per year. Of course, they're going to spend 3.5 this year. And we were right. saying, well, how about we buy 10,000 seats? Because that's all we need. And that's going to be, right. you know, $300,000, whatever the number is now. So we were able to uh, give an alternative, but stay in the Oracle ecosystem. So that's an example of, um, you know, yeah. a customer who knows their compliance position is able to drive down the cost and, and do something and, and have that alternative. It could be just a contractual alternative. We don't need a ULA. Give us this many licenses, yeah. or we do need a ULA. We don't want to buy that way. And if you're dictating that to Oracle, you're going to pick the contract vehicles that's best for you versus Oracle picking the one that's easiest for them. Yeah, that get that 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 whole notion of getting away from the EULA and going to a and going to a you know a a, a, a limited use uh, uh, licenses, you know, a certain number of seats or employee count or whatever. I mean, to me, that's huge. Those 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 EULA deals, they always 
they look great on the on the on the front end. You're always like like wow, that's wonderful. All you can eat, you know. I, I every every one of my organizations going to use this uh, software, but then you know the 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 price that you're paying that the price that's sort of baked into those uh, those EULA contracts is it's it's staggering. And frankly, when you try to get out of the EULA deals, uh, what you find is that's that's when that's when Oracle really starts feeling some you know, some negotiating pressure themselves. Um, the, the idea that you're not going to serve that you're not going to renew the EULA and, and, you know, instead flip over to a limited license is, uh, I, I think it's, I, like you said, it's, it's, it's a wake up call and we're always looking for those opportunities. You can't, you can't do it a week before the license expires, but it's something when you get, if you, if you plan enough ahead of time and you've got a strategy, you can win these negotiations. So Absolutely. You know, that EULA is, and, and they've been around now for probably what, 20 years, 15 years. So yeah. companies are going into the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh renewal at, at times. And uh, the price goes up. And I just tell folks, imagine if you, it, it sounds great, a three year, all you can eat. Imagine if I told you for the next three years, you were going to eat every meal at an all you can eat buffet. What would you look like in three years? <laughs> right? You're, Think about you're that. Stuck there. <laughs> you're stuck. You're not leaving in three years and you're going to be bloated. Let me right. tell you, unless you're really disciplined, right. that's, as, that me, I would be a disaster. Um, right. So um, so having alternatives is key. What about uh, specifics? Like if, if what are the, the, the most important terms and conditions? What should customers focus on, um, you know, for, for their benefit? What, what do they think maybe Oracle won't negotiate on that you think they will? Uh, yeah. Where, where are the big points that they should, uh, the big gotchas in those contracts that they need to prepare for? There's, there's a, there's a list of these that I keep, but I'll just, I'll just, I'll just throw one or two out there. And it comes, it comes from my experience with it, with particular clients, but it seems like it feels like the biggest gotcha comes from Oracle comes from, uh, either acquisition of entities or divestiture of entities or um, just general, you know, reorganizations of the business. Um, it feels like if you if you have a very simple corporate structure where it's just it's just one entity, they've got employees, and here's the here's the Oracle software that you're going to use. The company never changes. They never buy anybody. They never they never go into different business lines. It, it's 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 a very simple negotiation. The 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 situations that come to that come across my desk are always, gee, we've just we just bought this business, we've sold this other line, we've we've got multiple Oracle licenses from you know from different parties, um, and yet Oracle's telling us we basically have to buy everything from scratch. Well, if this was if this was negotiated back when those licenses were signed, there's a way of covering those uh, uh, those acquisitions so that acquired companies can just automatically you know, be folded into the existing Oracle license and you don't owe a whole, a whole second set of uh, license fees. Um, that to me is, that's, that's a way that I can quickly save a company like millions of dollars in, in future licenses when we, when we, when we're putting those terms and conditions together. But I see it's 129. I don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to go over and we've got the maybe questions from the audience. So, uh, yeah, but uh, before we do that, I just want to, because uh, we yeah, have another sure. poll question here too. The customer oh, definition. Oh, right, right. Yeah, the customer definition is is definitely, um, it's in the top three of, of things that cost companies lots and lots of money. Uh, we had one client sure. where they were about to sign and I was like, Larry, is the client's name, not Larry Ellison. I was like, Larry, you need to change this customer <laughs> definition because this is going to bite you at the end of this year life. Like, no, no, no. I was like, yeah. I want you to go back to Oracle and I want you to give them a million dollars more to change the customer definition. And I guarantee you, you will save that money tenfold in three years. Yeah. And they actually yeah. listened to me. They went and said, you know what? We'll give you a million dollars if you change the customer definition. And Oracle did. And um, yeah. it saved them a renewal, saved them a $12 million renewal uh, down the road. So absolutely. That's a nice victory. Nice yeah, victory. It, it really is. And um I wish they listened to me on everything because there was a couple of things that, that did bite them. But anyway, <laughs> so um, have your options uh, is, is definitely uh, really important. Now let's just focus because I think um, focus on the audits for a second because I think audits drive uh, negotiations, right? So 
We do have a question here. Are you currently being audited? Or I guess you say, have you ever been audited? And, you know, yes, it was very painful. Yes, it was super easy or you're not sure um, if, if you were audited. Um, but, uh, and I think that's where, um, you know, folks often reach out for attorneys, right? Is, hey, I'm being audited. Uh, so when should yep. a client reach out uh, to you for help in, in an audit? Well, uh, look, the, the, it doesn't necessarily have to be me. It's sometimes it's it's more about just getting your own internal legal counsel involved. So a lot of them have a general counsel's office, and unfortunately, the general counsel sometimes only finds the legal department only finds out that an audit is going on after after they get a demand from Oracle. At that point, it's really too late um, for for folks that are in the the IT areas and people who are directly dealing with Oracle, I would say you got to let your let your legal department know, let your law firm know, let somebody on that team know that you're that you're going to start the audit process before before saying yes to that. It's just there's just not much you can do after the after the audit's been done. And uh you know, frankly, I, that's also the part where I would want to have somebody like uh, Craig in my corner because the audit process is very technical and the and the way that it's counted you would you would think auditing means there's only one way of counting it but there's <laughs> there's like there's like five different ways of counting and I'm excuse me I'm not a technical guy like Craig is so I, I do my best here but I, I've I've had it explained to me a couple times but Craig you're the master of this I mean help me out on uh, understand from a layman's point of view what is where does the audit process get uh, uh, sort of warped or twisted in the, Yeah, so in the, if we can get the results the here, and, and Jeff, I have to say, no one's ever called me technical before, so thank you. That, okay. That's the opposite <laughs> of technical. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, a, a mix here, shocking, nobody said they were audited and it was easy. Um, but I think the, the challenge with audits is, um, and I'll get back to the, to the, to the question of who, who to get involved. When Oracle audits, um, they are looking for maximum leverage for Oracle. And you know, we talked about how there are certain, there's language in your contract and then there's language not in your contract. And do you use it? Do you not use it? These contracts are on purpose vague, right? This is not an accident. It's a feature of Oracle contracts, not a bug. So when Oracle does an audit, they're looking for maximum leverage, right? Versus when you, when you think of like a government audit, government auditors look for the ultimate truth. What's the ultimate truth here? So when we go in to a customer, when Palisade goes in, we look for ultimate truth. What's the ultimate truth here based on your agreements with Oracle? And then we help the customer put themselves in the best possible position of ultimate truth, right? And then it doesn't matter what Oracle says in terms of what that, what that big scary number is. But so I think that's, the, again, going back to the contracts and you know, how to get the best deal from Oracle, make sure there's as little ambiguity in those agreements as possible, because you might think you have a good deal here, but two years later, to your point from before, you do an acquisition and boom, now you got to give them 5 million more. Um, but as far yeah. as you know, when to get legal involved, I always, um, and this could be dating myself a little bit. I think about that movie Ghostbusters. You know, when they got a call in, they hit the big red button and all the alarms went off. <laughs> and it's the same. Yeah. It's not just Oracle, but there should be an yeah. audit response team, right? And, you know, yeah. hopefully you've got, uh, you know, experts on staff that know those vendors. If not, you bring in outside experts like yourself or me and you hit that button. You say, oh, we just got this letter. Let's bring out our playbook. Not let's yeah. figure out what to do now. Let's bring out the playbook. Yeah. Okay, we have the next three months, we're going to do these 12 things. And this is how we're going to run the audit. Because Oracle will run yeah. it to their advantage, right? And often how you yeah. manage the audit will be the result of the audit. Yeah, the audit, look, the audit process, look, when, when Oracle is presenting the audit process to the customer, I get the feeling I've, I've never been in the room when this happens, but I hear it later. It sounds like it's presented as a fairly, just a very, you know, innocent sort of clinical, almost like a, like a, like a completely 
sort of mechanical process. It's presented in a way that 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 all make, all, almost makes it sound like, yeah, we're just gonna we're just gonna go downstairs and make sure the car is in the spot that we left it in, or something like that. Yeah. It's very, you know, it's very simple. But really, what you should think about the audit process is the audit process is a is the beginning of fact gathering for for Oracle to come back later and say, you are not in compliance with your license. That's literally, that is literally what the end point of the, of the audit process is. And, and that only ends in two ways, which is either you paying, you paying Oracle the additional amount that they, that they think they're due as a result of the audit or Oracle turning around and saying, you're, you're getting sued for copyright infringement. You are, you've paid for, you paid for this much, but you're using that much, and and that that means uh, uh, that means you're now not in compliance with your with your with your license obligations. Um, these are these are very serious, very serious legal questions that that you know that go right to the back to the you know the the terms of the contract, and and there's you know there's technical points folded in there. So I I don't know. I always feel like if somebody said they wanted to audit my company, and I'm not a lawyer. I'd at least want to have some kind of expertise involved. Your 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 in-house legal team, somebody who really knows the technology, like uh, like Palisade, or or if you've got that internal capability, uh, uh, somebody who can have eyes on the uh, on the process and 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 be ready to ready to tell an alternative story. Because I think I think when Oracle does accounting, they count in a way that's that's going to be favorable to their position. And that's, a uh, um, if you don't have anybody to do, to do the count in a way that's favorable for your position, you're just going to end up accepting the Oracle version of it. That's, that's yeah. sort of a guaranteed loss. Yeah. There is a third, you know, you mentioned, you know, the, the, the true results of an audit, you can owe Oracle more, there can be copyright infringement. There are some audits that end up with, you don't Oracle anything, right? You're clean, right? So that does happen, right? Uh, it's not a huge number, but but that is the possibility. And obviously that's where, you know, hopefully you and I get involved and help the customers come through those audits clean, right? That's that's the ultimate goal. Oh, we would we right? love that. And that's yeah. yeah, and we should say that's that is that is absolute possibility out there. And and we I guess just because of the nature of the conversation, we're sort of talking like our worst uh, worst case scenarios all the time. So it's easy to, to go down that you path. You have to make allowance. When you're talking about Oracle, it's easy to go dark real fast. So yeah, yeah, we're not yeah. we're not uh, we're not normally this dark, but uh, uh, and and there's probably there's probably satisfied customers and people who don't need these services by the, the by the by the hundreds out there. So to to not to not to overstate it. The, the field that we work in are the things that where that where it's going wrong and that's when the the ability to like you like you said Craig the ability to hit that red button and know that there's somebody there with a playbook and a strategy uh, to, to help get you back on track that's kind of that's kind of where we where we step in yeah so I think you know when we go back to uh, how to get the best deal you know some of the things we, we touched on today um, make sure you have options make sure you're in compliance Make sure you have expertise, right? So do you know Oracle contracts as well as Oracle knows them? Do you know Oracle audits as well as Oracle knows Oracle audits? Do you know Oracle licensing yeah. as well? You know, those are all questions, to, you know, really have a, a look in the mirror and say, can I do this on my own? Am I as good as Oracle? Uh, that's a really important question. Uh, one thing before we go, and I wanted to, because um, I know you, um, you're in active negotiations with Oracle. What about timing? May 31st, yeah. do you see differences in behavior? You know, if, if we, we've got expertise, we've got um, compliance, we've got alternatives, what about the calendar? Are you still using that to yeah. drive a better deal? Always, always. The, 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 and I think Oracle uses the calendar to their advantage and, and we're sort of on the same, we're on the same field. Um, Oracle, Oracle generally doesn't, my experience is they don't put their they don't put their final numbers or prices out there until the last you know 24 to 48 hours before the deadline um i have i have gotten agreements signed uh uh literally right up until midnight uh of of the the you know the end of the quarter and in fact 
it's midnight California time, so as they count it. So you can so you can actually send Oracle, you know, signed documents at, at at two o'clock in the morning East Coast time, and they're as, as far as they're concerned, it, it came before the end of the quarter. But but yeah, their flexibility their flexibility goes up as the as the date draws near. Um, they also tend to get more insistent uh, as the date draws near because their their attitude is well it's impossible for us to rewrite this entire provision in 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 one or two days we're not going to look at that because because it's it's too late for us to get legal to approve that so oracle uses the calendar against customers uh it's possible for customers to use the calendar and the and the stopwatch against against oracle but um yeah, uh, to play that to play that game though, you really I think you really need somebody experienced at the at the wheel. Um, they're you know they're um, they 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 generally want those deals signed by the 31st for accounting reasons, for license reasons. The salespeople don't get their commissions if that if that document isn't signed. And and frankly, we've gotten we've gotten fantastic prices out of Oracle right at the you know right at the finish line there. So. It, it, there, there is reason to hold out some for some in some situations. Uh, you know, what do we're you not, see, Greg? We, yeah, we definitely. You know, we. I, I remember getting calls from. I still get the random calls from Oracle reps. You know, now and then, and like, what are you doing on this deal, Craig? You're killing me. And I'm like, listen, we're waiting. Right? You, you, I know that deal's coming, and um, so yeah. it's a little harder for them with with hardware because things have to ship, but uh, also. Right. It's no longer California time. It's Texas time, right? It's, Texas oh, I'm time, sorry. You're right. right. Texas time. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Fair so we enough. get a I couple. Of, it's only one a.m. for us, not not three a.m. But <laughs> right, right. I think you, you said something that um, I really want to focus on for a second because it, it goes to getting that best deal. When you're negotiating with Oracle, what they want to do is wait until the last possible moment before they give you an actual contract. So you think if you start the process on March 1st, Oracle would love nothing better than on May 20th to give you the first draft of those T's and C's, right? Because they're going yep. to have you hooked on the price. And then to Jeff's point, we can't change them. There's only two weeks left, right? So Too late. one recommendation is when you're talking to Oracle and you're thinking about buying their stuff and they're giving you those fancy PowerPoints and total cost of ownership and all the benefits, you say, thank you. That's the last presentation I want to see. The next thing I want to see from you is a Word document, terms and conditions with signature blocks of everything that you've approved. Then we'll start yeah. negotiating, right? Because um, unfortunately, you need to have cycles, right? You're going to redline it and it's going to come back. And, and if you have time to redline it 25 times, you'll get 25 versions of concessions. If you only have one red line, you only get one bite at the apple. So um, because yeah. those contracts, as you put it, are impenetrable, uh, it, it takes a while to decipher them and to really say, well, what's in here? What's not in here? What about that policy document? And then there's going to be surprises. And, and I'm going to defend the Oracle sales rep here for a second. They're going to be promising you things. And then they're going to, they've got to go tell someone, hey, this is what I told the customer. And then they've got to go request an approval and then somebody else has to draft it. And then it goes to an attorney and then it goes back and everybody's, by the time the sales rep gets it, it could be very different than what they asked for. And it could be very different than what you asked for. So there's going to be surprises when you get that first version and, and don't think of it as Oracle's trying to screw me here. Think of it as, well, they've got that process. Uh, they might be trying to screw you, but I, I, I like to give them the benefit of the doubt. You yeah, need time to go sure. through that, right? So if you get that contract on March 1st, or you get that contract on May 20th, you're, there's going to be two different results just by that one thing. So if you are one of those people who's negotiating and you still don't have a Word document, I'd probably end this call and pick up an, my phone and call Oracle and say, hey, next meeting we have, where's that Word document? Get a Word, get a Word document today and read it and read every word. And I, Craig, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. The the starting the process early enough so that you have input and you have the ability to give comments back to them is, is, is crucial. I can't imagine doing this and, and trying to negotiate those terms uh, in the, in the timetable, because it does have, it does take some time for Oracle to get through the approvals. Um, one small note on that. And you, you said something sort of interesting. Um, 
you mentioned the Oracle having to give the, the contracts back to the legal department and having the review there. I've found, I, I've found that the Oracle legal department is usually not a requirement for Oracle to give its approval to contract terms. What they will, they will sometimes point to, well, we can't, we have to wait for legal or we can't possibly get this to legal. I, I believe there's a set of terms or there's a set of like fallback positions that, that the, that the sales team itself has already has authority to put into place. In other words, in other words, I don't necessarily need to create language just from scratch and have the entire legal Oracle legal process review my drafting. All I need to know is that Oracle has Oracle has fallback positions for a lot of these terms and they're already they're already basically approved. They're already baked into their their Oracle software. It's only a question of whether or not you've you've now asked for this term to be I want the compromise position here. Well, wait a minute, we have to go to legal. No, you don't have to go to legal because you've got the you've got compromise language that's that's already you know, it's already been approved in five or six other contracts or 50 other contracts. Um, and, and a lot of times we'll get that con compromise language without, without ever having to go to the legal, the, the full legal review. Um, that's one yeah. way to save some time, I guess, if you've got, uh, you know, if you're, if your back is against the wall in terms of timing. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. You know, we'll have customers who will come to us with, we want, we want this language in there. And, and the first thing I say, well, what's the, what are you trying to protect yourself from? And they'll tell yeah. me, it's like, okay, well, how about this? Like, I know Oracle could do this or try that. Like, we want to put that, we're the interpreters, right? We want to put that right. problem the customer has in language that Oracle can understand to make that negotiation easier, honestly, right? We don't, we rather have them pull from a term sheet than have to go to an attorney for drafting, right? Because every attorney is going to do it differently, right? They've got, uh, it's interesting, you know, with the with the approval authority, um, I'll tell clients all the time, every single who has approval authority, I say every single person at Oracle is 100% empowered to say no. Anybody could say no. And there's 10 people who could say yes. So if we're dealing with something that's really non-standard, we got to get to one of those 10 people, right? Right, right. So, awesome. So uh, stay in compliance, have options, have expertise. Use the calendar. Um, start early. Start early. Uh, I think yeah. these are really great, concrete tips that uh, that customers can use. And, and I really appreciate your time here. I don't know. Did we have any questions from the audience? We've sort of been talking. I haven't seen anything pop up, Marissa. We did get one question in earlier today. Awesome. So that great. is um, this person. Um, is interested on if you guys have any thoughts on Oracle heavily promoting a ULA as part of a potential Exadata Cloud at Customer deal. Um, would you like me to take that one? <laughs> yeah, take it because I, I have uh, I have opinions about ULAs, but I've never heard of that that scenario. So basically, Exadata Cloud at Customer is Oracle has this hardware they sell Exadata. And um, what they'll do is they'll take one of these exit data machines and they'll put it in your data center and they'll manage it remotely. Oracle will manage it and they call it cloud. Oh. I, I, they probably recognize it as cloud revenue, uh, indecipherable. If you think their contracts are bad, their earnings now, forget it. You can't figure out how much is cloud and how much is licensed. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. So I think what Oracle is doing, and we've got several customers, this is a big pitch by Oracle these days, is to, uh, especially the customers that are really hesitant to move to the cloud, Oracle saying, well, buy some Exadata Cloud a customer. And here's the rub. And here's, here's why it's almost always a bad idea. Because when you do a ULA, you have an incentive to use more Oracle. You want to start your ULA with 100 licenses and end your ULA with 10,000 licenses because your maintenance doesn't change and, and all that fun stuff. When you consolidate on Exadata and Exadata Cloud, you need fewer cores and fewer processors. So right. you have one contract that incents you to go up and you have another contract that incents you to go down because uh, the idea is you, if, if the Exadata Cloud solution works for you, 
you need less servers. You can turn off all those other servers and, and consolidate here. So you have contracts going in completely opposite directions. Uh, so it's almost always a bad idea unless you do some of the things that Jeff and I have been talking about. Start early, really negotiate those contracts, give some flexibility, like your support costs should go down then, right? If you're spending 10 million a year on support and Oracle says, yeah. use less stuff and buy, great. How does my 10 million go down to 3 million? Um, that, that would be the conversation I would have with Oracle. And then the other thing is, um, you just want to make sure this technical solution is right for you, right? The first thing I ask the customer is, listen, if we didn't worry about Oracle licensing, if that were, what, what do you want to adopt? What is, what is your IT team telling you is the most important thing for you to move to? Like, we'll figure out a way how to get there and, and right. we'll deal with Oracle a, along the way. So I think, um, you know, that for me, that's, it's the conflicting goals. And, and in those contracts, it doesn't say what the goal is. It doesn't say how to optimize this contract. So it's sort of the unwritten rules. If you sign both of these, here's the problem you're going to have. Yeah. But what I've, do you think about I've ULAs? The, you, you said you had some thoughts on ULAs in general. Oh, yeah. Well, I've seen, look, at I've, I, I've, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned it because of what I've seen is, is it sounds like it's almost like the opposite question. What, what, what I've seen Oracle do is they'll take they'll say, okay, you're about to, you're about to sign up for, for ULA for whatever X million dollars. Uh, but what we're really pushing right now is uh, cloud is cloud services for, for whatever reason that's as a corporate matter, Oracle really wants to see those cloud services go up. So what they'll do is they'll actually, they'll actually say, okay, we'll knock, uh, we'll knock a million dollars off the EULA price and you, but you have to buy $750,000 worth of cloud services. It's not, it's not cloud services that the customer actually needs right now, but they can, they can record part of the port of part of the purchase price of, of the transaction as being dedicated to uh, cloud services. So I've seen, I've seen customers able to get discounts where they're purchasing they're purchasing something that really wasn't part of their 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 path forwards, but just because it happened to be a way to take down the total price of the uh, of of the you know of the of the product or the you know the total spend for that for that renewal. Right. I, 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 I don't know. I've, I've got mixed feelings on that. The the EULAs themselves, though, the EULAs themselves seems to they really lock a customer into a a very tight pattern. And like you said, it's. It's 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 a constantly increasing number of licenses. It's it's like uh, you know the the pressure is is really there to grow and to be using more Oracle because that's under those circumstances the the EULA really does uh, give you the right economic incentives. So yeah, and it it, it definitely lock you in on support, um, which you know if again if you're going to be moving to third party support you want to talk to Romini yep. and you're in a ULA you know that so a lot of our the work more. is helping customers get out of these ULAs so they can have that flexibility yeah. to to do what we talked about earlier um, you know there there is a there is a segment of the population where ULA is perfect for right so we we like yep. to call that our what's the zebra everybody knows what a zebra is you don't really have to describe it to people you know we're looking for the customer that's a zebra when it comes to the ULA so if, if a customer comes to us and, hey, we're, we're like, you're not a zebra, you're a lion, right? You, you just, oh, you know, you're, and it's customers that are really growing, um, but also have controls in place so they can get out of the ULA. First ULA can be great. Second ULA is hardly ever great. Third one is probably a disaster. Uh, you, right. And I should say it's not a disaster in that it's hurting you, but you're now spending more than you need to spend with Oracle. If you had managed ULA number one and ULA number two correctly, you right. wouldn't need uh, ULA number three. Um, so um, anyway, that is uh, anything else, Marissa, from the audience? No, those were all the questions we had today. Thank you. That's Wonderful. great. Well, Jeff, I appreciate your time and your partnership over the years and helping Oracle customers sort of... Uh, be liberated and reduce their risks and spend less money. It's, it's, it's great. It's to wonderful. Been, it's been wonderful working with you guys too. It's I'm telling you, it's a, it's, it's been, a, it's been a true education. I feel like it's, it's been a, a PhD uh, understanding and in, uh, in Oracle stuff. And I, I always, I always welcome the chance to, to team up with you guys. 
well, well thank you we, we we don't venture outside of our oracle world we are just so um but yeah. you do you venture outside so you're helping customers with a lot of uh it uh, transactions that are not oracle, I see, right? you're not oracle only i see other i see other vendors i see other i see other contracts and uh and and like I said, Oracle is Oracle is its own special, you know, uh, sub sub. It's its own planet of uh, of issues. Uh, there's there's really not another there's not another vendor out there like them. And that's uh, you know, look, they their their software must be worthwhile be to so many people because because people put up with these conditions and go through this process to get the to get the end product. So I I, I can only take uh, I can only look at the market and say there must be. Uh, uh, there must be reasons for all this. Right, right. No, awesome. Well, anybody who wants to reach out to Jeff or myself, okay. Palisade, um, here's our contact information. Um, we're happy to help you through your Oracle negotiations or other Oracle challenges or non-Oracle negotiations. If you need help with Microsoft or SAP or Google or Salesforce, you can reach out to Jeff as well on that. And uh, with that, I think we'll we'll wrap up for today. So again, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Marissa. And thanks everyone for your time today. Good luck with May and Oracle. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, Marissa. Thank you everybody for listening to us. It's been wonderful. Thank you.